Okay, okay then continue. All right, let us begin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our weekly webinar organized by the College of Physicians Malaysia. The theme of the month is endocrinology, and we are very fortunate to have Dr. Siti Sana, consultant endocrinologist from Hospital Sutana Noor Zahira, Kuala Tengganu, to be our chairperson today. Uh, Dr. Sana completed her MRCP in 2015 and fellowship in endocrinology in 2022. She's an uh, prolific author of many publications, as well as key speaker for numerous symposiums and conferences regarding endocrinology in the country. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Siti Sam. Thank you, Kelvin, for the kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, College of Physicians Malaysia for inviting me and Dr. Siva for this uh, session this week. So basically, let me introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Siva Shankari uh, Mugilar Rasen is actually a consultant endocrinologist and head of internal medicine uh, in hospital typing. So she graduated uh, uh, her, she graduated from HUSM uh, for her undergraduate study in 2005 and obtained her postgraduate MRCP in 2014. She uh, joined our uh, uh, subspecialty in endocrinology in 2018 and uh, under this, she actually went for overseas attachment in Princess Alexandria Hospital, Brisbane. So she has an extensive uh, professional experience in 11 different hospitals throughout her 18 years of medical career. And uh, today, I would like to invite her to uh, talk about approach to hyperprolactinemia. So I would like to pass the session to Siva. Thank you, Dr. Siti Sana, for the kind introduction. And thank you for the College of Physicians for giving me this opportunity to share uh, on uh, the topic of approach to hyperprolactinemia. So this is the outline of my presentation. So I would uh, run through uh, about the secretion and regulation of uh, prolactin hormone, the causes and symptoms of hyperprolactinemia, uh, some uh, sharing on macroprolactin, drug-induced hyperprolactinemia, diagnosis and management of prolactinoma, and role of surgery and radiotherapy in prolactinoma. So as we all know, pituitary is the master gland uh, which is in the size of a P, and it has anterior and posterior lobes. And the anterior lobe secretes six main hormones, including the prolactin, and the posterior lobe secretes the oxytocin and vasopressin. So how is prolactin hormone is regulated? So prolactin is regulated uh, mainly by the inhibitory effects of dopamine, whereby the dopamine inhibits D2 receptors. Uh, the dopamine actually binds to the D2 receptors, and uh, it will cause inhibition of the prolactin uh, gene transcription, inhibit the synthesis and release of prolactin, and as well as directly inhibiting the lactotrope proliferation. Prolactin is secreted by the lactotrope cells which stimulates and proliferate, stimulates the proliferation of memory cells, preparing the breastfeeding women. And uh, on the opposition, uh, the prolactin is stimulated by TRH, the thyrotropin releasing hormone, serotonin and estrogen. Uh, and prolactin is metabolized in the liver and cleared in the kidney. So uh, as we can see in this uh, diagram, whereby the dopamine has the inhibitory effect uh, by reducing the prolactin secretion. Okay, so what is a hyperprolactinemia? Hyperprolactinemia means excess of prolactin secretion above the upper limit of normal. So it does not need any dynamic testing. And what is the best time to measure the prolactin hormone? It is during the uh, fasting state and about two to three hours after waking. Hyperprolactinemia could be physiological, pathological, or idiopathic, and it has a female preponderance with peak prevalence of uh, among women who are aged 25 to 34, usually in the childbearing age. And the prevalence is three times uh, 
uh, more among the women compared to the men. And in women uh, with menstrual irregularity, the hyperprolactinemia can be present up to 25%, and 30% when there is galactoria or infertility, and 75% when they have both amenorrhea and galactoria. So this is the normal value of prolactin. In male, about less than 14 microgram per liter, and female, less than 24, but the reference range is less than 26.4 microgram per liter in the, among the women. And for us to convert to the milli IU uh, unit, so we need to times by 21.2. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, so the, we have to take actually a detailed medical and pharmacological rule out some other causes of uh, prolactinoma. So uh, as, uh, as I said, uh, prolactin is metabolized in the liver. So among patients with liver cirrhosis, the prolactin is reduced. Likewise, in patients with the renal insufficiency or CKD, there will be reduction in the clearance of the prolactin thereby the prolactin level will be high in the blood. And in, high, in primary hypothyroidism, the TRH hormone will be high. So that the high TRH hormone would stimulate the prolactin, uh, will stimulate the prolactin secretion. The other causes would be adrenal insufficiency, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and drug-induced uh, hyperprolactinemia. So this is one of the, among the commonest causes would be drug-induced uh, hyperprolactinemia. So when we look at physiological causes of hyperprolactinemia, pregnancy, lactation, stress uh, are the other common causes. And um, when we look at pharmacological causes, what are the common drugs that cause uh, hyperprolactinemia? So the uh, main hormone, uh, the main medication that causes hyperprolactinemia is uh, antipsychotic drugs like the typical antipsychotic risperidone, antihypertensives like the verapamil, antidepressants uh, uh, from the group of uh, SSRI or TCAs, antiepileptic drugs, and uh, opioids, as well as uh, oral contraceptives. So when we take a history from the women, we have to ask whether the patient is taking oral contraceptives. The, the magnitude of hyperprolactinemia is linear uh, with the cause of uh, hyperprolactinemia. So usually uh, among those with medication-induced hyperprolactinemia, it's about one to five times upper limit normal. However, risperidone, can uh, cause rise in prolactin in up to 10 times upper limit normal. In uh, cases of pituitary stop compression, uh, the prolactin can go up up to five to 10 times and in micro, uh, as well as in microprolactinoma. But in macroprolactinoma, the level should be higher, about 20 times the upper limit normal. And in giant prolactinomas, it is more than uh, 1,000, which is 40 times the upper limit. What are the common symptoms of hyperprolactinemia? So the women uh, in the premenopausal age present with galactoria, and men uh, would present with hypogonadism or low bone density or osteoporosis, similar to women who present with hypogonadism. And those who have uh, macroprolactinoma would present with compressive symptoms uh, caused by the by the tumor uh, encasing to the surrounding structures. So in male, the hypogonadism could uh, present as erectile dysfunction, gynecomastia, loss of libido or fatigue. Whereas in female, uh, they present with oligomenorrhea, whereby the menstrual cycles are end ovulatory with uh, menses of four to nine cycles per year, or amenorrhea, whereby there is absence of menses for six months. And some women in the childbearing age would also present with infertility. So what causes the hypogonadism? So when the uh, prolactin is high, it inhibits the kispeptin uh, in the hypothalamus, whereby it, reduce, it inhibits the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone. Uh, with reduction in GnRH, the LH and FSH is also reduced. 
subsequently causing reduction in the testosterone and uh, estrogen and uh, in the women. The prolactin could also cause direct inhibition of gonadotropins and steroidogenesis in the male. So this is uh, to show that the International uh, Federation for Obstetric and Gynes, uh, Gynecology, uh, they have um, uh, defined the normal menstrual cycle as 24 to 38 days. So when the menstrual cycle becomes irregular, uh, up to an end ovulatory cycle, so the patient presents with amenorrhea. And pituitary cause is considered type 2. And what are the common uh, compressive symptoms? Some patients come with headache, uh, vomiting, uh, and, uh, uh, and other patients come with uh, super, uh, uh, when there is supracellular extension, so they present with visual uh, peripheral vision restriction. And uh, when, the, when the tumor uh, extends to the lateral extension, patients present with cranial nerve pulses. So here we can see that the pituitary gland is housed in a bony structure, which is called cella tussica. And this uh, here over here, we can see the anterior and posterior pituitary gland. And above the pituitary gland is the hypothalamus and the optic chiasm. So when the tumor extends superiorly, it can compress the optic chiasm and cause visual field defect. And laterally, all the cranial nerves are here from two to cranial nerve two to cranial nerve five. Uh, when we are considering uh, the causes for uh, hypoprolactinoma, macroprolactin plays a big role as well. There are three types of prolactin isomers that present in the circulation. Uh, small prolactin, which is the isomer uh, monomeric prolactin that we are measuring. And there is a big prolactin and big, big prolactin. The big, big prolactin is called the macroprolactin, whereby there is a, a macromolecular complex of prolactin with the immunoglobulin G. It has minimal activity and pathological function. However, it is very invariably detected in the current prolactin immunoassay. So from a clinical perspective, it's important to identify the presence of macroprolactin so that we would avoid inappropriate treatment and investigations uh, uh, for the patients. So macroprolactin usually comprises less than 10% of the circulating pro prolactin, but it is found in hyperprolactinemia samples up to 46%. So when do we measure macroprolactin? When the patient is asymptomatic and the prolactin level is uh, very high, more than five times. And when there is a clinic, atypical clinical picture and conflicting prolactin results in different assays. And also when there is lack of uh, decline in the serum prolactin levels with the treatment of dopamine agonists. And, we su and the suggestion is to screen the patient's uh, with macroadenoma and prolactin level in the gray area, about 100 to 200 nanogram. So how are the macro macroprolactin measured? So the gold standard uh, is by uh, measuring through gel filtration chromatography, which is very tedious and usually not done. So the common test that's been uh, uh, adopted now is the uh, PET precipitation recovery polyethylene glycol uh, precipitation recovery. This is simpler, uh, cost-effective, and it is measured as percentage. The newer uh, uh, methods which are used, uh, they use uh, uh, ROC curve analysis to determine the prolactin post-packed uh, uh, precipitation. It has higher sensitivity, but it is costly. So the polyethylene glycol, uh, glycol precipitation it uh, measures the amount of macroprolactin in percentage. Uh, so uh, macroprolactin is diagnosed when the PEC precipitation ratio is more than 60% or the post-recovery prolactin is less than 40%. So now let's look at antipsychotic induced hyperprolactinemia. 
So uh, as I mentioned earlier, risperidone uh, causes, uh, is the, one of the uh, common cause of uh, hyperprolactinemia. And uh, in risperidone, the prolactin can go up to 200 to 250 microgram per liter. Whereas uh, eripiprazole uh, is the uh, new, uh, newer uh, antipsychotics, which is neutral and does not cause uh, any uh, rise in prolactin. In fact, it, is a, it has some dopamine agonist effect. So uh, it, in fact, helps to reduce the prolactin level. So how do we manage anti-psychotic induced hyperprolactinemia? The common strategies uh, adopted by the psychiatrists are by dose reduction. As we know, hyperprolactinemia is dose dependent. So uh, when the patient is stable, uh, they, may, uh, uh, they may adopt to reduce the dose of the antipsychotic. But in patients uh, who are unstable and they have uh, uncontrolled uh, psychotic symptoms, so they would add uh, eripiprazole as the adjunct prolact. Uh, it is a prolactin sparing antipsychotic. And most studies report that there is a significant improvement in symptoms combined with normalization of prolactin levels within a few weeks of stopping. However, switching to eripiprazole was reported to be more effective compared to uh, reduction dose strategy. MRI pituitary is uh, indicated when, uh, the, when we are unable to switch or when the prolactin is uh, very high, more than 3,000. Now let's look at prolactinoma. Prolactinoma is a benign tumor of pituitary gland and it is the commonest cause of pituitary adenoma, about 50%. And the prevalence is 50 per 100,000 population. And the incidence is three to five new cases per 100,000 year. Majority, it presents as uh, sporadic. However, sometimes it is associated with other uh, syndromes like uh, MEN1, carny complex, and uh, FIPA or familial isolated macroprolactinoma. So we should uh, suspect this when the patient presents very young and also there is family history. So uh, in all prolactinomas, it is suggested to evaluate IGF-1 because uh, IGF could uh, present, I mean, acromegaly could present uh, as co-secreting co tumor. So prolactinoma and uh, IGF-1 could uh, have a, a co-secretion. And the uh, prolactinomas are classified according to their tumor size. So uh, macro, micro prolactinoma uh, is when the tumor is less than 10 millimeters mercury which is more than 90% of cases. Macroprolactinoma is when the tumor is more than 10 millimeter and giant prolactinoma is when it's more than four centimeter. So giant prolactinoma occurs in one to 5% of these cases. And uh, giant pro prolactinoma usually is more common in men compared to women, about nine to 1%, nine, nine is to one uh, ratio. Although uh, prolactinoma is more common in women, but giant prolactinoma is more common among the men. So let's look at the management of prolactinoma. So uh, we have uh, two guidelines, one by the Endocrine Society in 2011 and the Italian Association of Clinical Endocrinologists in 2022. So, uh, what are the, uh, so what is the first line of treatment for prolactinoma? Prolactinoma is very sensitive to dopamine agonists. So our first line of medication is uh, uh, with dopamine agonists. And what are the goals of treatment? So we treat the patient to restore the hypogonadism. As we know, when the patient is in a condition of hypogonadism for a long term, they can develop uh, other complications like uh, osteoporosis, uh, low, low bone mineral density, and uh, cardiovascular risk. So uh, the other indications to treat with dopamine agonists would be galactoria, infertility, uh, to treat the infertility fertility in premenopausal women desiring pregnancy, and also for tumor shrinkage in macroprolactinoma. So we have uh, two main uh, types of uh, dopamine agonists which we commonly use here. 
which is uh, bromocryptin and carbogalin. And uh, both bromocryptin and carbogalin, uh, carbogalin are effective at normalizing the prolactin level and also to achieve tumor shrinkage. And the significant tumor shrinkage can occur as quickly as three to eight days after the initiation of treatment. And the tumor size reduction parallels with improvement in the prolactin level. So usually bromocryptin is uh, started with a low dose of 1.25 milligram a day and subsequently increased to, to 2.5 milligram. And it can be increased up to 15 milligram per day. Whereas for carbogolin, we start with 0 0.25 milligram once or twice a week and up titrate up to two milligram a day, two milligram per weekly. And uh, quinacolide is another type of uh, dopamine agonist, uh, uh, which is not commonly used over here. Carbogalin has a higher efficacy and less side effect compared to bromocryptin, uh, but bromocryptin has shorter half-life and it is cheaper. The, what are the side effects? So common side effects of uh, both the dopamine agonists are vomiting, uh, diarrhea, and uh, GI side effect. And when we look at uh, carbogol uh, carbogolin, it has uh, the side, side effect of impulse control, uh, impulse control disorder, whereby there's increase in signal for gambling, shopping, eating, and hypersexuality. There's also a, a rare side effect of uh, psychosis in less than 1% of patients. And when we start patients with on uh, dopamine agonists, when there is a rapid tumor shrinkage, it can cause CSF uh, nasal uh, leak, which can happen in the first few weeks of starting the medication. So uh, what is recommended uh, with regards to the side effect of uh, carbogolin? So carbogolin could also cause uh, valvular dysfunction, especially the tricuspid valvular dis uh, dysfunction. But uh, th therefore, uh, we need to do a periodic cardiac auscultation and as well as echo in patients with a murmur or when they are consuming more than two milligram per week of carbogolin without uh, overlooking other extra endocrine causes. So uh, once we start the patient on uh, dopamine agonists, we need to do periodic prolactin measurement. So in the initial phase, uh, especially in cases of macro prolactinoma, we can do it uh, two weekly to uh, once a month. And uh, uh, in micro prolactinomas, we, uh, re we repeat the MRIs within one year. So the aim is to achieve normalization of prolactin within one year. However, in macro prolactinoma, uh, we aim to achieve normalization within three months to six months of initiation. And visual field assessment. Uh, should be done in all uh, macroprolactinoma patients and uh, should be repeated uh, for improvement. And bone mineral density when the presence of hypogonadism is uh, long-term and when we suspect patient could have uh, bone mineral uh, reduction in bone mineral density. How long should we continue the treatment of uh, my, uh, with the uh, dopamine agonist? So in microprolactinoma, uh, it is safe to withdraw the dopamine agonist after uh, two years of uh, uh, treating the patient with dopamine agonist in, in which patients they have achieved a normal prolactin level and there is a significant tumor volume reduction more than 50%. And the measurement of uh, serum prolactin should be every three months for the first year and then yearly. And uh, usually repeat MRI is not necessary unless the prolactin level is rising from the normal uh, range or from, uh, from the normal range. And some meta-analysis shows that the remission rate after uh, stop withdrawal of uh, uh, dopamine agonists is about 21 to 36%. So the risk of relapse is high. So usually it is recommended to continue lifelong uh, um, uh, pro, uh, lifelong dopamine agonists in male patients to maintain normal sex hormones. And in females, it is uh, safe to stop after menopause. So usually we will continue up to the age of 50. 
And in uh, macroprolactinoma, the remission rate is about 16 to 32% after withdrawal of dopamine agonists. So the treatment should be lifelong and the at time of withdrawal is only occasionally successful, but requires uh, follow up. The surgical option could be also considered uh, to obtain remission in these patients so that uh, we can allow the patient to get rid of any uh, continuous treatment. We do have uh, dopamine agonist resistance among all this uh, micro and macro prolactinoma. So the definition is when there is failure to achieve a normal prolactin level on a maximum tolerated dopamine agonist, and also when there is a failure to achieve a 50% of reduction in the tumor size. So the dopamine agonist resistance occurs 10% in microprolactinoma and 80 up to 18% in macroprolactinoma. And, and it is more common among the men than the women. What are the alternative therapies in these patients with the dopamine agonist resistance? So we could use uh, temozolomide, which is an oral uh, medication, uh, surgery or radiotherapy. And in uh, prolactinomas, we have few indications for surgery. So when we can't achieve a quick improvement of severe neuroophthalmic damage, like when the patient comes with, uh, 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 with compression of optic chiasm, causing visual field defect, uh, optic atrophy. So when we can't uh, reverse the symptoms within the first two weeks, so we can consider surgery in these patients. And also when there, is patient, when there are patients who can't tolerate a dopamine agonist or they have resistance towards dopamine agonists, we can propose surgery. And some patients may develop complications with the dopamine agonists like CSF leak or pituitary apoplexy with severe visual disturbance. So we could refer these patients to the neurosurgeon. And in some patients who are willing to take chronic pharmacological treatment, uh, it is allowed to consider surgery. So uh, what are the indications of radiotherapy? So in functioning tumors like prolactinoma, when the, hormon, uh, yeah, when the, uh, when the hormonally uncontrolled after maximum surgery, I mean, when, when the tumor is not well controlled uh, with the maximum medical therapy or surgery, then we can propose for radiotherapy. And tumor growth or extension that cannot be surgically addressed due to patient being a non-surgical candidate or the tumor is progressing uh, and it's not surgically inaccessible, like involving the cavernous sinus. So we can also propose radiotherapy. So radio surgery, the stereotactic uh, radio, uh, radio surgery uh, is more preferred and it should be used over fractionated radiotherapy unless the tumor is too close to the optic pathways less than four millimeter or it tends to diffusely infiltrate the surrounding anatomical structures. The SRS or gamma knife radiotherapy, uh, it normalizes the serum prolactin level in 25% of patients achieving uh, a partial hormonal response, response in over 60%, and also it helps to reduce the tumor size in over 50%. In uh, patients uh, who have done radiotherapy, we should follow them up uh, yearly to evaluate for development of hypopituitarism. The effect of pregnancy and lactation on prolactinoma. During pregnancy, the prolactin increases in response to increasing estradiol, ranging from 35 to 600 microgram per liter. And the increase in prolactin is accompanied by the proliferation and hypertrophy of the lactotrope in the pituitary gland. So the tumor, there is pituitary tumor regrowth and the risk is about 2.4% in microprolactinoma and up to 21% in those with macroprolactinoma and they have not done any previous uh, therapy or they are not controlled with uh, dopamine agonist previously. However, when we have controlled the macroprolactinoma within the cellar region below one uh, centimeter, the risk reduces to 4.7%. In pregnancy, uh, 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 bromocryptin and carbogolin can be used safely. So there are no teratogenic effect or long-term adverse effects seen in children who have received dopamine agonists uh, in utero. And breastfeeding 
should not be restricted in patients with a microprotectinoma or they have been stable, but the dopamine agonist cannot be used until the patient wants to stop breastfeeding. So uh, in the preconception uh, management, so we should, uh, for those patients who are uh, having macroprolactinoma with a mass size of more than one centimeter, we should uh, advise them for contraception. We don't want them to get pregnant until the tumor is well controlled. They have been stable on uh, dopamine agonists for two years at least and with normalization of prolactin. And there is also tumor reduction within the cellar boundaries. And in patients with microprolactinoma, before uh, the conception, um, if the uh, patient has normal prolactin and they have been stable, so we can allow them to get pregnant. And when they get pregnant, the dopamine agonist can be withdrawn. Whereas in macroprolactinoma, uh, when they have been stable with, on, uh, with the dopamine agonist like carbagolin, it should be continued during the pregnancy. So uh, it, will, uh, it will not cause increase in the size of the prolactinoma during the pregnancy or postpartum uh, duration. So uh, uh, let me share a few cases. So the first case is an 18 year old Malay lady who was recently diagnosed with schizophrenia with poorly controlled symptoms. And she presented with galactoria, which started three months after initiation of the antipsychotic. However, her menses were still regular. Uh, she did not complain of any visual impairment. There was no uh, symptoms of headache. And also there was no other uh, cause like OCP in this patient. And she was on haloperidol and olanzapine. And on examination, the examination was unremarkable. There were no features of acromegaly or pushing or no visual field con uh, defect. And her prolactin was 70 microgram per liter, almost uh, three times upper limit. And the repeated uh, prolactin was also 86 microgram per liter. And all other anterior pituitary hormones were normal. And uh, the psychiatry team proceeded with the MRI pituitary. And the pituitary gland was normal. Uh, however, it had a convex upper border, which, which is quite commonly seen in adolescent uh, patients. So uh, in this patient, uh, we, the, the option was given to psychiatrists to add adjunct uh, aripiprazole in view of reduction of dose or switching was not possible in this patient who was uh, having uncontrolled uh, psychotic symptoms. And the patient uh, was all, and also uh, 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 advised to monitor the prolactin level closely. And if in any condition the patient develops amenorrhea, then to add uh, oral contraceptives. So this is the MRI of the patient. Uh, the first uh, MRI is a T1 plane, uh, both are T1 plane uh, MRI. And we can see here, uh, there is a posterior bright spot and um, homogeneously uh, enlarged, uh, I mean, a homogeneous pituitary gland with upper border convexity. And it is uh, uh, close in close proximity with the optic chasm, but it is not impinging uh, the optic chasm. In the second case, we have a 22-year-old uh, Indian lady who was a first-year medical student. She presented with a secondary amenorrhea for one year, uh, associated with acne and hirsutism, uh, which is uh, hyperandrogenic symptoms. And she was given a medroxyprogesterone withdrawal bleed once uh, in March 2022. Uh, she also did not have any uh, obstructive symptoms, galactoria, uh, or taking any other medications. And uh, her examination showed that uh, she had her sutism, acne, and uh, her BMI was 30. And her blood test showed a prolactin of uh, 46 microgram per liter, which is about 1.8 upper limit of uh, normal. Her LH was twice the level of um, FSH with a low uh, level of estradiol and, her, and all her other um, hormones were unremarkable except for the testosterone was elevated and uh, fasting. She also had uh, 
pre-diabetic state with the impaired fasting glucose of 6.2 and an HbA1c of 5.9. So she was diagnosed with uh, polycystic ovarian sin syndrome. So in cases of polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, up to 8% of patients may present with hyperprolactinemia. And subsequently, she was uh, managed with a lifestyle modification and metformin uh, 500 milligram BD, which was up titrated to one gram BD. Uh, third case, uh, this was a 21-year-old Malay lady who was married for three years. She presented with oligomenorrhea and galactoria and headache for past two years. However, she denied any visual disturbance. And she went to a GP in December, 2021. And her prolactin at that time was 714 microgram per liter. And she was started on bromocryptin 1.25 milligram for two weeks. But, and she was advised for an MRI pituitary. However, she defaulted due to financial constraint. And subsequently, she was started on oral contraceptive pills. And she presented to endocrine in January this year with amenorrhea and hyperprolactinemia. She was still on OCP and her LMP was uh, about a year ago. And on examination, her, there was no visual field defect, no neurological deficit or acromegaly features. And this was her blood investigation result, uh, which showed that the prolactin was uh, almost 30 times upper limit of normal. Her cortisol uh, in the beginning was normal. Uh, uh, however, uh, estradiol was low, which was consistent with her anovulatory cycle. And uh, the prolactin was repeated after stopping the oral contraceptive pill, and it was still high. And uh, subsequent uh, cortisol was low. It was uh, 146 uh, at 8 a.m. in the morning. And, uh, a and a synecton test was proceeded and it showed inadequate response at 380 nanomole at 30 minutes. So uh, patient was referred for eye assessment, uh, which showed bilateral uh, bitemporal inferior quadrantonopia. And also there was some uh, features to suggest optic atrophy whereby the uh, cup test ratio was increased at uh, 0 0.8, the normal is 0 0.3. And there was also thinning of the uh, neural retina. So uh, we discussed, uh, although patient did not have much uh, uh, visual, uh, uh, visual field effect, uh, this was noticed by the ophthalmologist. And the MRI pituitary showed a lobulated solid cystic heterogeneous uh, mass, which was 1.8 by 2.4 by 2 centimeter with a supracellar extension uh, compressing the optic chasm, as well as lateral extension into bilateral cavernous sinus. So a uh, patient was uh, also, ref uh, I mean, there was a neuro MDT uh, discussion and uh, uh, impression at that time was macroprolactinemia, uh, macroprolactinoma with mild optic atrophy. So the plan was to continue medical therapy with close monitoring of visual field assessment uh, monthly. And if, if there is no response uh, to proceed with surgery. So patient was started on carbogolin 0.25 milligram biweekly and also hydrocortisone uh, replacement. And patient was also advised on the caution of uh, pituitary apoplexy, whereby uh, there's a risk of bleeding uh, in the pituitary gland when we initiate the patient on uh, dopamine agonist, as well as CSF uh, leak, uh, whereby uh, when there is a sudden shrink of tumor, it can cause uh, the CSF leak, and also uh, worsening of visual impairment uh, due to the pulling of the optic tract. So this is the MRI image, the T1 uh, coronal plane showing uh, um, a mass in the uh, pituitary, uh, in the cellar region with a supracellar extension, like a snowman appearance. And it is in close proximity and impinging the optic chasm above. And in the second picture here, this is a sagittal T1 post-contrasted uh, uh, film also showing a supracellar extension and a homogeneous, uh, inhomogeneously heterogeneous enhancement of the pituitary gland. So, in uh, usually, uh, pituitary uh, gland is uh, homogeneously 
uh, when, when they are post contrast, uh, there is homogeneous enhancement. Over here, we can see some inhomogeneity. And over here in T2, uh, T2 coronal view, we can see that there is fluid level, which is uh, suggesting a cystic component in the prolactinoma. So this was the visual field assessment, Humphrey visual field assessment, which shows a bilateral inferior quadrant tonopia. So uh, for the progress of the patient, so once the patient was started on uh, carbagolin 0.25 milligram twice a week, within 10 days, the prolactin reduced remarkably from 30 times upper limit to six times upper limit. And uh, by three weeks, uh, it reduced to two times upper limit. And uh, around uh, uh, about two months, uh, before two months of the treatment, a uh, patient uh, actually developed some vomiting. So she did have some side effect to the carbogaline. Uh, so she self-reduced uh, the carbogaline. When we increase, actually we increase the dose of uh, carbogaline from 0 0.25 to uh, from two times to three times per week. Uh, after two, after 10 days, but subsequently she couldn't tolerate and she self-reduced. And uh, there was some rise in prolactin from 36.49 to 74.29. And subsequently, uh, patient agreed to take carbogolin 0.5 milligram twice a week. And after three months, uh, her prolactin did come down uh, to 62.22. And during the review after three months, there were no more uh, galactoria or headache. However, the menses has not resumed and her visual field assessment was improving. And the repeat MRI showed there was a 30 to 50% reduction uh, in the tumor size from 1.3 by 1.5 by 1.4 centimeter, uh, sorry, from, from 1.8 by 2.4 by 2 centimeter to 1.3 by 1.5 by 1.4 centimeter. So the tumor was still abutting the optic chasm, extending to the bilateral cavernous, however, uh, bi bilateral cavernous sinus. However, the ICAs were still preserved. So we are still continuing her medical therapy with close monitoring and she's due to see the neurosurgeon. So in summary, hyperprolactinemia can be due to physiological uh, cause or underlying uh, chronic medical illness or drug-induced uh, uh, causes, uh, as well as prolactinoma, which is the commonest cause of up to 50% of cases. And in drug-induced hyperprolactinoma, uh, prolactinemia, withdrawal of drug causes normalization of prolactin. And dopamine agonist is the first-line therapy with proven efficacy in normalizing prolactin, restoring ovulation in premenopausal women, and gonadal function in men, as well as tumor shrinkage in prolactinoma. And carbogalin is more effective with better tolerability compared to bromocryptine. Surgery and radiotherapy is rarely required as second or third line option. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hiva, for the very comprehensive lecture on prolactinomas. Okay, so basically, I think we have few questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, I would like to invite the audience to address your questions in the Q and A box. Uh, while I start, uh, 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 we start to go through the first question. So, uh, so I think there's a question whereby they actually ask, uh, "My patient has acromegalic features, okay, uh, and but uh, the, pen, the the patient has pending IGF one. So, the hyperprolactinemia is about more than one thousand. I'm not sure what's the unit here." So, um, and now the symptom persists despite on 0 0.25 milligram twice a week of carbogolin. So, when would you normally titrate up the dose? And what is the prevalence of co secreting prolactinoma together with acromegaly? And the patient is due for MRI next month as well. And eye assessment, no visual field um, defect so far by the ophthalmology colleague. Uh, Siva, you are on mute. I'm sorry. Yeah, so we can up titrate uh, the uh, carbogolin uh, uh, every week, actually, uh, in a safe manner uh, from 0 0.25 uh, milligram twice a week. Then we can up titrate to 0 0.25 three times a week 
and subsequently or 0.5 milligram two times or three times per week up to a maximum tolerated dose up to two milligram in a week okay. and uh, also uh, watch for uh, pituitary apoplexy and uh, CSF leak uh, at the same time. And uh, prevalence of co-secretion, uh, I think it's about 20, 20 to 30%, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. okay. so, uh, so I think uh, basically uh, for, uh, uh, I think if we go by endocrine society guideline, they mentioned that uh, the patient should be evaluated after a month after initiation commencement of carbagolin. But I think we can go by clinical uh, setup as well. If you think that the patient might need a repeat, a repeat prolactin level earlier, then you might want to bring the patient in earlier for a prolactin level. So um, I think the uh, if the patient has acromegaly, it's about 50% of them can have um, uh, prolactinoma as well, co-secreting prolactin as well. And uh, so uh, I think at the same time, if you're thinking about acromegaly, you can actually, while waiting for the IGF-1, you can assess the patient metabolically for acromegaly-associated condition, you know, like diabetes, hypertension, their CV risk as well, um, because of the prevalence of high CV event, uh, high CV risk as well in acromegaly patients. And if you are worried about the, the I mean, the duration, the TOT of you getting the IGF-1 result, you can actually give a call to the endocrine lab in Putrajaya actually to just ask for the IGF-1 level earlier for the result. Okay. So I think we can... Um, uh, and we can, also, uh, yeah. also, I mean, the uh, yeah. the is also responsive to the carbogolin treatment. Yes. Yes, yeah, I agree. Okay. Yeah, it's one of the medical therapy for acromegaly as well, dopamine agonist. And I think uh, for maximum dosing, even if uh, from my experience, uh, like the maximum dose that I've ever seen someone give was actually Prof Azmi, 7 mg per week. He actually gave 1 mg daily for one uh, very giant prolactinoma patient. But uh, to uh, my from my personal experience, I've never given that high yeah. that high dose. And even I think if endoshock, they mentioned something about 11 milligram per week. Uh, the dose that they've given but uh, to be frank I, I personally I never have this experience of giving a very very high dose but uh, Siva is right so we can just keep on titrating uh, uh, depends on the clinically and you can just be evaluated earlier after that and I just keep on titrating the dose this yeah. patient there was a uh, visual field uh, disturbance as well this patient uh, uh, according oh, uh, to the yeah uh, apparently no there's no visual field defect okay. yeah but uh, yeah there is a large uh, adenoma and there is a visual field defect. Then we should, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, we should get an early MRI for this patient and discuss in the multidisciplinary meeting. Yeah, agree. And I think, uh, yeah, it's a, because they, uh, because for acromegaly usually it's a macro adenoma. Most of the time, seventy percent of acromegaly they are macro, more than one centimeter. So um, okay, but at the same time, you know, uh, the, the, there's no visual field defect from the visual perimetry, formal visual perimetry. So yeah, maybe that that's a quite a reassuring point there as well. Yeah. So uh, we can go to the second question here. Okay, hi. Do we uh, stop carbagolin if patient become pregnant? Or we stop only for microprolactinoma but not macro? And do we need to stop? Or is it we need to stop carbagolin regardless whether they are micro or macro prolactinoma? Yeah. So in micro prolactinoma, we can stop if they have uh, achieved uh, normalization of prolactin before pregnancy. And uh, even during pregnancy, we just do a, a trimester basis uh, of uh, visual field assessment. So we don't monitor the prolactin. So we can safely uh, stop uh, the carbogolin in micro prolactinoma. And if the patient has sudden symptoms like a severe headache or, you know, there's visual field uh, defect, then we should proceed with a non-contrasted MRI to evaluate again during pregnancy. But however, in macro prolactinoma, we should uh, continue the prolactin. So pre-conception, like what I mentioned earlier, if the uh, size of the pituitary mass is within the cella less than one centimeter, then we can allow them to get pregnant safely. And during pregnancy, they have to continue the carbogolin throughout. Yes, agree. Okay. And then I think for macro, I think it depends whether the, it confront, uh, I mean, uh, how responsive is the patient to treatment before pregnancy, like whether they've achieved normal prolactinemia and whether the tumor sh uh, size have shrunk significantly and confined to the intracellular area. So, because these are the patients that 
uh, during pregnancy, they have lesser risk of uh, getting um, all these compressive symptoms, uh, significant enlargement, etc. Because we know that all the estradiol stimulation, it can cause lactotroph hypoplasia, which might increase the pituitary volume by two, two times the upper uh, limit of the usual volume. Okay, uh, I'm not sure the questions keep on coming. Okay, all right. Uh, so NFPA, non-functional pituitary adenoma, can also cause hyperprolactinemia. So how do we want to differentiate this from prolactinoma? Yeah, so the level of the prolactin, uh, like what I mentioned earlier here, so the in, in compression uh, of uh, pituitary stock, so the, the rise in prolactin is about five times, whereas in uh, prolactinoma, it is more than 10 times. Uh, the upper limit normal. Yeah. So, so basically, like if you have a macro adenoma and then you have a prolactin level, like I think like very borderline, like, you know, like 2000 milli IU per liter, that sort of thing. So it's not proportionate to the size. So I think like uh, Siva mentioned just now, you should be uh, uh, lysing with your uh, chemical pathologist to actually do a dilution. So you can ask for a dilution, one in 100 dilution, uh, so that you can actually get the actual result. So if it's uh, actually, if the result still persistently the same after you've diluted one in 100, then most likely this is stock effect. Then if it's increased after the dilution, then probably this is actually a prolactinoma as well. So I think lies on with the chemical pathologist as well, right, Siva, I think. So that's the hook effect. Um, yeah. And uh, for female patients who are sexually active, when can we allow the patient to embark on pregnancy if they have macro prolactinoma? I think we have. We covered that. Yeah, we covered this as well. All right. Okay. So how fast is the effect of prolactin on prolactinoma? Is it weeks, months, or is it dose dependent and depends on the size of prolactinoma? The normalization of prolactin, is it? Yeah. Yeah, how how fast is the effect of? of I think the uh, I think uh, the question is maybe carbagolin on prolactin. I think. Okay, yeah. the effect how of fast is the effect of carbagolin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, prolactin normalization can be seen within the first week, about three days yeah. to uh, eight days. We can yeah. already see reduction in uh, prolactin. Yes. Agree. It's because uh, prolactinoma is very uh, carbagolin, it's very dopamine agonist sensitive. Uh, so that's why I think uh, Siva actually highlighted as well that you always have to watch out for all this uh, CSF leak because you know it can shrink very rapidly if you like, especially if you have a very large macro adenoma or giant prolactinoma, that sort of thing, because they are very dopamine agonist sensitive. Yeah. So um, what is snowman appearance means? Yeah, so, uh, snowman is like, uh, I think I showed the image just now. So when the uh, prolactinoma uh, uh, enlarges uh, superiorly from the cellar region, uh, going up to the optic chasm, so it, it has the snowman, like a appearance, like eight, figure of eight, uh, like a eight or snowman appearance, we call it. Um, I think it was in the case study. Yeah. It's the third case, right? So, yeah, probably it's not very clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. basically when you have a cella with supracellar extension, so the, because you have that uh, in between that, you have that indentation, indentation, indentation so you will look as if like it's a um, snowman appearance. So it, it actually extends from the cella to the supracellar. So you have like two, I don't know, I'm, I'm already showing my hand already right here. Okay, because you have that indentation in the middle. Okay, all right. So um, the next question will be, uh, in patients with prolactinoma but develop apoplexy, do we still manage this with dopamine agonist or is surgery immediately indicated? Yeah, so usually uh, we can manage them medically and also, uh, you know, in uh, pituitary uh, apoplexy, there is a risk of hypocortisolism. So uh, we should uh, treat the patient with... Uh, uh, if the patient in the inpatient setting, IV hydrocortisone and monitor the patient because the hypocortisol can cause hyponatremia and other electrolyte imbalances. So uh, we should treat the patient uh, with the uh, hydrocort and also uh, dopamine agonist. And we can closely monitor the patient if there's no cranial nerve pulses and yeah. 
uh, patient is stable, uh, no uh, worsening uh, 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 neurological deficit. So we can still uh, closely monitor the patient. But uh, if let's say the patient develops more uh, cranial nerve palsies or uh, there is uh, a worsening of the visual defect, then uh, we need to refer for urgent surgeon. So not all apoplexy we immediately send for surgery. Actually, there's few indication like Dr. Siva have highlighted. So um, uh, with regards to stopping dopamine agonist in pregnant lady with microplectinoma, in which trimester would you stop the dopamine agonist and when do you restart? Does the level of prolactin matter? No, so we can uh, stop uh, as soon as the patient gets to know yeah. their prolactin. Yes. So in the first trimester, and uh, we don't have to monitor the prolactin throughout the yes. pregnancy, and we would only monitor uh, once the patient stops breastfeeding, and uh, it is safe for the patient uh, to uh, go through the pregnancy and lactation. So we just uh, yeah. do a trimester. Uh, we do a visual field assessment every trimester. Yeah. Okay. So do you wait for the MRI P23 before starting dopamine agonist for hyperprolactinemia? No, we don't uh, wait for the uh, MRI actually because uh, once there's uh, hyperprolactinemia and there's a uh, clinical uh, evidence, uh, you know, we are suggesting microprolactinoma, there's no visual field defect, we can start uh, carbocholine. Yeah. Because I think it's a bit, of course, uh, ideally in IV setup, you want to have a baseline size of the macroprolactinoma. And then when we talk about uh, tapering off the carbagolin, we're talking about uh, the predictor re the predictor for uh, remission is uh, if you have a 50% reduction in your uh, macroprolactinoma compared to the baseline. So, of course, uh, ideally in IV setup, you would want a baseline size. And then after commencement of treatment, what is the size uh, have shrunk to that sort of thing. But it's it's just that in our setup, you know, let's say the patient come in with 20,000 milli IU per liter of uh, prolactin level, but you know, our MRI is six months down the line. So it's a bit difficult to, you know, just really wait for the MRI before uh, starting the carbagolin as well. So um, uh, another question is uh, for co secreting tumor IGF1 and prolactin, would DA help with the acromegaly? Yeah, I think uh, Siva have answered that as well. Uh, so basically, of course, when we talk about medical therapy or bridging therapy for acromegaly, the number one, the first line is always otrotite la. Okay, so it's, it's the otrotite la. So it's either your otrotite or your life serotype, your pasirotite, that sort of thing. But uh, the, the carbagolin does have a role as well. But although the efficacy is not as good as your otrotite la, it's maybe it's about 50 to 60% efficacy depending on the literature as well. Yeah. Okay, um, is visual field defect reversible after surgery? Hemianopia versus total blindness? Mm. So it depends on the extent of uh, injury and how long the compression has been there. Oh. So sometimes uh, the visual field defect is uh, reversible, but in some condition, it, there could be some permanent damage that has been done. True. I think, uh, and then I think it depends on the uh, visual field harm free before uh, uh, preoperatively, how bad is the visual field defect already? And then if the patient already have some sort of optic atrophy, mean that the compression has been there for for a long period of time. So it's a bit difficult for you to say that they would really have a hundred percent uh visual field uh improvement after operation. So yeah. Uh what is the probability of microprolactinema progressing into macro? Would you repeat MRI P23 on regular interval to monitor the size of tumor for microprolactinoma? No, usually uh, it does not uh, progress to yeah. become yeah. Uh, macroprolactinoma. And uh, usually we don't need to do uh, a regular or serial uh, MRI. We just uh, base on prolactin uh, levels. But at any time prolactin levels increases, then we should uh, repeat the imaging. Okay. And I think we are at the last two. Last three question. If patients are unable to tolerate dopamine agonists, for example, if they vomit, uh, they have a vomiting on carbagoli, will you change to other dopamine agonists or should you uh, ask the patient to go for surgery? So quinacolide has uh, less uh, vomiting uh, side effect. I mean, the side effect is uh, less compared to carbagolin and uh, bromocryptin. However, it is uh, less effective compared to carbogolin. So we can give the option uh, of uh, giving a uh, 
for the patient. But however, uh, if the patient, um, uh, usually we will uh, ask the patient to like space out the carbogolin uh, and also to take it at night. And, uh, you know, sometimes we do give uh, anti, uh, you know, I mean, to ask them to uh, take it, uh, gra we gradually increase, we don't increase uh, immediately, like, uh, you know, 0.25 twice a week to four times a week, like uh, we, we ask the patient to go gradually, but it depends if it's a micro or macro prolactinoma. So if it's a macro prolactinoma, then we should uh, refer for surgery if the patient really cannot tolerate the uh, carbogolin because that's one of the indications. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is explain, please. Uh, I, I'm not sure maybe you can elaborate further. Like I'm not sure what which part to explain. Uh, but okay, uh, while on carbogolin on practinoma, let's say we suspect a CSF leg, while, while patient complain of persistent running nose, anything that we can do while awaiting neurosurgeon response, surely need to rule out meningitis, anything we can give to the patient or stopping the carbogolin perhaps? Yeah, uh, so we should refer to the ENT uh, surgeon uh, immediately for assessment and uh, uh, we, we, we should stop the carbogolin and... Uh, uh, as mentioned, like, you know, sometimes uh, we can prophylactically start uh, the antibiotic to cover yeah. for meningitis um, yeah. and, uh, you know, uh, assess from there. So the usually the ENT colleagues uh, would be able to help to seal the CSF leak. Yeah, okay. And uh, I think uh, here basically is this is the thing that uh, you should tell the patient beforehand when you start the patient on carbogodin, like, you know, if you have some sort of running nose, that sort of thing, just come immediately to the ED and don't wait until the next follow-up. So I think there's another testing, what they call a, a beta transferring um, testing for the CSF for the running, uh, if you have a running nose, and then there's a testing, what they call a beta to transferring testing for the uh, running nose, the, the fluid for you to tell for sure whether this is actually CSF or not CSF. Yeah, so I think that's another thing that maybe we can consider doing while waiting for the neurosurgical clinic to come in. And of course, commencement of antibiotic to avoid all the ascending infections and everything. So um, yeah, I think we address all the questions, Hiba, and right on time as well at 4 p.m. sharp. So, uh, uh, Siva, do you have any last word to the audience before we wrap up the session today? So, um, uh, I would like to uh, highlight that, uh, you know, uh, uh, prolactinoma still uh, is one of the commonest cause of hypoprolactinemia, about 50%. So, uh, after we have ruled out all other causes, uh, they should uh, be, you know, uh, investigated further to rule out uh, micro or micro prolactinoma and early referral is very important so that uh, they don't develop all the compli chronic complications of uh, hypogonadism and also visual field disturbances. Uh, we do get patients who present late uh, and, and in uh, macro adenoma, uh, the peripheral visual field defect, uh, the patients may not have uh, uh, realized until up to 50% of the visual field is uh, affected. Yeah. Okay. Right. So in so, male, uh, they present with hypogonadism. Okay. okay. Actually, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Calvin. I would like to thank Dr. Siva as well for the very nice talk and very beautiful cases illustration. Okay, so uh, I think we had up until 160 uh, attendees just now as well. So thank you for all the attendees for attending this talk as well. So uh, let's wrap the um, the talk for to, to for this, this session for today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much.